Luke chapter 2, and we'll read from 39 through the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 2, reading from 39 through the end of the chapter. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. And so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And so when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And so the passage that before this that we dealt with or completed last week speaks about Jesus' presentation or dedication in the temple. Uh, this is after 40 days of, uh, after his birth. And uh, then it says that when they had performed all things according to the law, in other words, the dedication of the Lord Jesus, obviously on the eighth day he was circumcised. Uh, Mary has now done the pur purification uh, ritual. And uh, all of these things have been done. It says they returned to Galilee. Now you'll see again that Luke is making a very specific point here about the fact that everything was performed according to the law. One of the principles in the atonement, in the, in the death of the Lord Jesus, is that obviously he had to uh, be a righteous sacrifice for us. If he had sinned, uh, then he would have to die for his own sins, and he could not die for us. And so he would have to, of necessity, have been perfect in all of his life, including his obedience to the law. And we're going to see this in two respects this morning. The first is in the fulfillment of the law. And so he fulfills, uh, and obviously he's a, he's a baby at this point, so it's not really up to him, but his parents are very careful to make sure that everything is fulfilled uh, and that everything is done according to the law. Remember also that there is a difference between men's traditions, the many laws that the rabbis had added to the word of God at this point. Jesus is not obligated to keep those details, those other additional laws, uh, but he is obligated obviously to keep the law that God had given. And so it says they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth, obviously the place where they had come from. Um, it's interesting that the um, NIV says to their own town, and for those of us who come from outside of America, we, don't, we differentiate between towns and cities. Uh, these are not cities, they are towns in the sense that they are small villages. And so really, it should really have said village, but anyhow, they, they returned to Nazareth. Because remember, they had come from Nazareth, Mary and Joseph had come from Nazareth, had gone to Bethlehem for the census, and now they return. Now, there's a gap here, and it doesn't change the uh, authenticity of the, of the scripture or the, uh, the inspiration of it, but uh, Luke is simply jumping over some details, because remember that none of the gospel writers can include every detail about the life of the Lord Jesus. They're giving the things that are important and that are important from their perspective. And of course, the bit that is missing here is, uh, is quite a bit, actually, um, but it is not relative to Luke's message. Uh, the first thing that is missing is the, uh, the coming of the wise men. And if you go to the book of Matthew, you'll find that the wise men come, and the wise men come to Bethlehem. 
So did the wise men come before or after the 40 day, 40th day when they're in the temple? It, it, it really doesn't matter that much. But then you remember that immediately after the wise men came, they flee to Egypt in order to fulfill the scripture that says, out of Egypt, God will call his son. And so that is not in here. And so there's a whole gap. And so when it says then that uh, they fulfilled everything, they returned to Nazareth. Uh, the, in between that really is then the wise men, the trip down to Egypt for a period of time of two or three years. And then from there they go back to Nazareth. It doesn't change anything. It's just not relevant to what Luke is trying to say. And so they return to Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now I'm going to skip this verse because we're going to deal with it again uh, probably next week when we get down to verse 51. And, um, at the end of, uh, sorry, verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And so Luke this twice and obviously for uh, for a reason and I'll deal with that when we when we get down to verse 52 now the gap there's now another gap and of course the gap here is now 12 years we see Jesus in his infancy up to his 40th day and then it says that they went down to Egypt and then there is nothing until he is 12 years old and they go to Jerusalem and then after that, again, obviously there is nothing until he begins his ministry at the age of 30. Um, but this is an important uh, little glimpse into the life of Jesus and into his, uh, the way that he grows up. Um, and, uh, and it is an important glimpse because it also contains the first statement that Jesus makes. And the first statement he makes is a very important statement. And so this little story about Jesus staying behind in Jerusalem is a very important part of the picture. And obviously the, the writers then include that for us. And so his parents went up to Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. So they were keeping the law again. You see the same emphasis. They are particularly careful about making sure they keep the law. They are pious, they are religious, they are serving God with uh, all of the, um, the, the, the ability that they have. The law required that the males, didn't require the women, but it did require the men to go to the uh, temple three times a year for three uh, feasts. The feast of Passover, the feast of Pentecost, and the feast of booths. And um, I, I don't think we've ever taught on those feasts here, and maybe we'll do that one of these days. Uh, but for those three different feasts, the men are required to go up to Jerusalem. And obviously, uh, they, uh, they take their families, and uh, these were, these were uh, major events for them. Uh, it was an opportunity to see all their family and their friends, because really the whole nation would come together. About 200,000 people would gather in Jerusalem, a city who would normally only have 20 or 30,000 people. So it would increase in, in population by 10 times during these, uh, these feast times. And so every year they would go up to the Passover. Now at this time, at this stage, in the history of Israel, um, uh, the main feast that everybody would attend would be the Passover. The, um, the, the rabbis and the uh, Sanhedrin um, cut them a lot of slack as far as the other two feasts were concerned. And so not everybody would, now, would still go up at this time for, the, uh, for Pentecost and for booths. Um, many would stay behind. Those who, who came, because remember people were not just coming from Israel. People were coming from all over the world. As we see in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, there are people from all over the world, Jews from everywhere. Not only Jews, but those who had been uh, adopted into or had adopted the Jewish faith, had been uh, accepted uh, in, in Judaism. They came from all over the world, and they would generally, if they traveled that far, they would come for the Passover, and they would stay on for Pentecost, which would, not be, uh, which would be a month uh, round, round numbers later. And so this was the main feast. 
it was a period of a week. Remember that there are two feasts together here, and I know this is a lot of information, but it helps us to understand the background. There are two feasts that are uh, attached to one another, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, they were attached to such an extent that they, are, they were generally referred to by the one name, the Feast of Passover. But they were really two feasts instituted by God. And you remember the Passover was at the night, you remember the night they came out of Egypt and that the angel of death passed over the doors or the, the, the houses where the blood had been sprinkled on the doorposts. Um, and those houses that did not have the blood, which would mainly have been Egyptian houses, the oldest in the family or the firstborn in the family would, uh, would die. And so uh, at the same time, uh, they would, that would begin, so that would be on the first day, let's say. Um, and so the, the uh, lambs would be slain uh, in the afternoon, at three o'clock in the afternoon, and that evening they would eat the Passover meal. And then from there on would be seven days of unleavened bread. They would cleanse the house, uh, they would search through the house, find any uh, evidence of unleavened bread, of, of leavened bread uh, or of leaven. Uh, they would burn that ceremonially and then they would have a period of seven days uh, without leaven. And, and uh, those religious Jews still, those Jews that are religious still keep those, those feasts today. Um, and in fact, the uh, unleavened uh, bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is so serious for some that they have two complete, almost two complete kitchens, um, separate dishes and pots and pans for the unleavened food and then for the leavened food just in case uh, a little bit of leaven somehow got from one to the other and made it through the dishwasher. Um, but um, th that was obviously not uh, necessary, it's not prescribed, but um, th th that's just what they do. And so they went up to Jerusalem every year for the Feast of the Passover. This was their normal thing. And when he was 12 years old, they went to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. So they did what they always do, they did what the feast said, but it says that he was 12 years old. Why does it mention that he is 12 years old? Well, because this is an important time in the life of the Lord Jesus. When he was 13, he would have what they today call the Bar Mitzvah, and that was already instituted at that time. The Bar Mitzvah happens for boys when they are 13. It happens for girls when they are 12, and it's called a Bat Mitzvah, uh, whereas for boys it is a Bar Mitzvah. Bar, you should recognize the meaning of that word. Simon bar Jonah, bar meaning son of. Mitzvah, command. So he becomes the son of the command, a son of the law. So at 13, he would become obligated to keep the law. It didn't mean that children under 13 could do whatever they chose, but they were, according to Jewish custom, not according to God's law, but according to Jewish custom, they were not required to keep the law. But when a boy became 13, and it's misunderstood, people say, well, that's in Jewish custom when he becomes a man. Uh, he does not become a man when he is 13, but he becomes accountable to keep the law when he is 13. And so... This is when he is 12. The year before he becomes 13, his training is intensified, every Jewish boy. So they would receive training in the synagogue um, or in the temple if they lived in Jerusalem uh, up to the period uh, or up to the 13th birthday. At the 13th birthday, he then becomes a son of the commandment. He, he, he then get, becomes accountable. But in the last year, his training is intensified. His training of the law, what the law requires of him. And remember, it's not just the 613 commands contained in the Old Testament. It's the whole of the Talmud, which is an encyclopedia that big uh, today in books, um, containing thousands and thousands and thousands of commandments that they had added to the 613 that God had given uh, Israel. And so he is trained in all of these things. So Jesus is preparing for this time when he would, according to custom, become accountable. So his training is intensified. He's spending more time in what they call shul or school, 
and he is, being, uh, he is studying the scriptures. And so it's at this time that he comes to Jerusalem. Now, obviously their custom was to come every year. It, it, and this doesn't happen when he is 11, but it happens when he's 12. I, I also find it very interesting that none of the gospel writers speak about his bar mitzvah, which they must have been because that was the custom already at that time. Nothing speaks about when he was 13 and he goes to the temple and he goes through that ritual. And, and that's important. It's important because it shows that God is not concerned with human customs, human traditions. Even though they may be very uh, spiritual and they may have uh, very good reasons and motives for having those things, they are not part of God's law and God really doesn't pay attention to them. And so the scripture says nothing about his bar mitzvah, but it says something about this very important occasion when he is a year from his bar mitzvah and that he, uh, that he comes to the temple. So he was 12 years old and he went up to Jerusalem. They went up to Jerusalem according to the custom. When they'd finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother did not know it. So he stays behind. Now there are theologians that will argue about the fact that he was being purposefully disobedient because he knew that the rest had, were going and somehow he stayed behind. Now he could not have been, the scripture doesn't even deal with it, but he could not have been purposely disobedient because if he had, he would have broken the command that says you must honor or respect your parents. In being disobedient to his parents, doing something that is on purpose wrong would be sin. Now that's important because we say, and you say, well, that's, that's not a big deal. It is a big deal. And in fact, you'll see when we get to verse 52 or 51, it says that he was subject to his parents. He did everything they told him to do. And we say, well, you know, children being disobedient, that's just what children do. But it's still sin. And Jesus would have been disqualified from being the perfect sacrifice without spot and without blemish had he disobeyed his parents one time because he would have broken the law. And so he is not doing this out of, out of spite. He's not doing this out of rebellion. But somehow he is obviously just engrossed with what he is doing and with the teachings of the rabbis and, and what these men are, 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 are saying. And so he's absorbed by these things and somehow he doesn't even notice that his parents had gone. Now, th there are two people who were not noticing what was going on. In fact, three people. Jesus didn't notice that his parents had left. And that's no big deal, because he says, I have to be about my father's business. But his parents also had not realized he was not there. And that is a big deal, because it was their responsibility to make sure that he was, he was with them. So when they'd finished the days, in other words, after the seven days, they returned. The boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. You say, well, why didn't they know it? Well, I, I, know, I know somebody who went home from church and left their kid behind here. <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's one thing to have five people in the car and one is missing and you don't know that he's missing. But here we're not talking about five people traveling together. We're talking about thousands of people traveling together. Literally thousands of people. The whole nation would come together and they would travel together and they would travel back home. And they would be talking about the feasts and all of the things that God has done and about the meaning of the feasts and all of these wonderful things. The women probably traveled alone, uh, separate from the men and the children probably sat, traveled separate from, from, the, from the rest of them. Uh, because it was just one massive family. They were all friends. They were all related in the sense that they were all Israelites. And so they're going back home and they're going back by their, literally by their thousands.
And so the fact that Jesus isn't there is uh, obvious, it's obviously not a, not a problem until it gets to that evening. And then they start looking for him. By, ne- by now they, they're a day away. Now, now the, the journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem is about a three-day journey. So, so, so this, is a, this is a big trip. It's three days to Jerusalem, a week in Jerusalem, another three days back home again. And so so, uh, verse 44 says, but supposing him to have been in the company. In other words, he's, he's got to be somewhere amongst all these people. They went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when it, it seems that when it became evening, they looked for him. And they started asking questions, and they went around wherever they were camping uh, along the way, and um, they, they, they can't find him. He's, he's not there. And verse 45 says, and so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. I think that there's an important lesson here for us. And the lesson is that it is easy for us to get so engrossed with our religious activities and they may be legitimate stuff the feast was an important thing it was it was ordered by God it was there to remember God's deliverance out of Egypt and so they do they're doing the right things but in the process they lost Jesus And folk, I wonder how many churches today and how many Christians are in churches today who will be so involved in the singing of the hymns or the worship or the preaching and even the ministry of the word, but somehow lose Jesus. It becomes about the feast and about the fellowship and about the wonderful times we're having and speaking to our meeting all of our lost, uh, our long uh, seen friends and, and all of these things become important. But somehow Jesus is forgotten and he's not part of it anymore. I have in the last few weeks as we've dealt with various things in the ministry outside here, had to ask some serious questions about my own ministry and about ministries of, of others. And I've become aware how that it's so easy to get involved in stuff of ministry and lose out with Jesus. Where people will spend days and hours and weeks and months writing and researching on all sorts of stuff, but Jesus is not there. He somehow got left behind. And folk, we can do everything right. We can keep the law. We can keep the Passover. And I'm not saying us as, as, as Gentiles, but uh, the, the Jews, they, they're doing everything right. But Jesus is not there. And you can do everything right. You can go to church. You can keep the law you can, or, or the scriptures. You can be obedient. You can pray. You can worship. You can tithe. You can do whatever you like. But if Jesus is not in it, if he, Jesus is not with you, if he's not there, And if he's not what it's all about, you're wasting your time. And what you need to do is go back and find him where you left him. You see, that's the problem is is he doesn't leave us, we leave him. And it's amazing how that we can be involved in our spiritual stuff. And even in my own, in my own life, I, I, I begin the day and I begin working on, 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 on the things that I have to work with in terms of ministry-related stuff. And I get to a point somewhere in the day where I realize I, I left Jesus behind. I'm so busy studying the scriptures. I'm so busy reading and writing. I'm so busy counseling and doing the things that I do. But somehow I've forgotten about Jesus. And folk, we need to get back to where he is and go and find him. He hasn't moved. He's not the one who moved on. We're the ones who move on without him. And I want to challenge you this morning. Is Jesus still with you? I'm not suggesting that, because remember he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm not speaking about him leaving you in that sense. But somehow we forget about him. We get busy with the stuff we do. And he's not there anymore. Is he still the center of everything you're doing? 
You see, the center of everything that we're doing here this morning is a church. Is it about him or is it about church? And you remember, this is, not a, this is not a unique problem. You remember, this was the same problem with the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation chapter 2. The most religious and the most doctrinally correct of all the seven churches in the book of Revelation. But what's their problem? They'd left their first love. Who's the first love? Jesus. They'd fallen in love with their doctrine, with their religion, with their doctrinal correctness, with their, their structural correctness, because they were able to figure out who were false apostles and who were true apostles. They were able to do all of these things. They were working hard. In fact, you remember, they, they have 11 things that God commends them for that they're doing right. They're doing everything right. But they left their first love. It wasn't about Jesus anymore. It was about the church. It was about the other stuff that they were doing. And Jesus wasn't in there. Remember the same problem with Peter. After he had denied the Lord Jesus and Jesus meets them at the seashore after they had not caught fish all night and then they had this big haul of fish and Jesus prepares breakfast for them. Peter in the mean, before that had denied Jesus three times. I don't know the man. And yet Jesus asks him only one question. And the question didn't have to do with his doctrine. While doctrine is absolutely important, and if you're new, new here this morning, I'm fastidious about doctrine. Doctrine has to be right. It is important. It is paramount. But it can never be more important than Jesus. And Jesus doesn't ask Peter, do you understand that I am the Messiah? Do you understand how I fulfilled the scriptures? Do you understand that I had to rise the third day? Do you understand? He just asks him nothing about those things. There's one question. Where am I in your life? Peter, do you love me? Am I number one in your life? That's the only question Jesus asks Peter. And the church of Ephesus, while they have everything right, they fail because he says, you have, he says, remember from where you have fallen. What a statement. You have fallen. In other words, he's saying the church is a fallen church. I'm not saying they're not, they're not saved anymore. But then he contains, it contains the warning. He says, I'm going to remove your lampstand. In other words, I'm going to take away your franchise as a church. Because of one issue. Remember they came to Jesus and they said to him, what is the most important command? And you know the answer. You shall love the Lord. And folk, it doesn't matter how holy you live. It doesn't matter how much you know about the scriptures. If you don't love Jesus, number one. If he is not what it's all about. If he's not the first thing you think about in the morning and the last one that you think about at night, you have left your first love. You have left him behind. And there's only one thing to do, and that is to get back to where he is. I mean, obviously, in the case of Mary and Joseph, it would have been, it would have been foolish for them to say, Ah, oh, well, he'll catch up. We'll, we'll just keep going. He'll eventually get there. And yet that's exactly what we do. We, we, we realize, maybe at a moment like this, when we're being challenged by the Word and by the Spirit, and we say, well, yeah, you know, it, 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 it'll work out. It's not going to work out. You need to get back to where He is. And you need to go and find Him. You need to get back on your knees. You need to get back in the Word. You need to get back to get your mind out of Facebook and back into a relationship with Jesus. And by the way, I've been very conflicted about Facebook myself recently. And I no longer look at Facebook. Been a couple of days and it's not easy. But there are more important things than Facebook. 
There are more important things than just reading your Bible without Jesus. We need to go and find him. And we need to restore him into our presence, into our midst, and walk with him. And so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. And may I challenge you that if you forget anything else that I've said this morning, that there's one thing that you go away and said, I've got to find Jesus. I've got to seek him and find him. And I need to restore him to his right place in my life, in my thoughts, in my love. Now, so it was in verse 46, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Now, the three days, um, there's uh, arguments about what the three days, how do you count the three days? Well, to me, it's pretty simple. It's a day that they had been away. They take an, have to obviously takes another day to get back to Jerusalem and then another day of find, looking for him and then they find him. So that's the three, the three days. Is there a parallel with the three days in the grave? Well, I suppose there, there is in a sense, uh, not just because it's three days, but for three days Jesus is hidden from them. Uh, he, is, he is out of sight and then after three days he is restored to them. And so in a sense it does connect to the, to the uh, resurrection, um, but I don't believe that that's the uh, real important point that he is making here. Um, simply that it's a, it's a long period and, and, and of course the, 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 the point is that for, what is Jesus doing for three days? For those who are worried what time I'm going to finish today, Jesus is in church for three days. Never mind one hour. Three days. Folk, when we get the vision of God and His will and His work and His house and His word, and these are all things that we'll, we'll come to next week because I'm not going to get there this week, but Jesus says, I have to be about my Father's house or my Father's business. That's the important thing. And when we're about our Father's business, three days doesn't matter. Three days disappears like one minute. And so if you find the sermon too long this morning, may I say with respect, you have a problem. Because it's going to be 45 minutes by the time I'm done, which is nothing like three days. But for three days, Jesus is sitting and he is absolutely spellbound by the word of God. Remember the Pharisees and the teachers, and it uses the word, this translation uses the word teachers correctly. The King James uses the word doctors. Uh, the Greek word didaskalos meaning teachers. And it's the only time Luke uses the word teachers for the Pharisees. After that he calls them by other names because Jesus then becomes the teacher. So in Luke... The word teacher is used at this point for the rabbis. And from this point onwards, or from the beginning of his ministry rather, onwards, Jesus becomes the teacher. At this point, he is being taught. Now, I know that may horrify some. Jesus did not know everything because he was God in the flesh. A very important part of this understanding, we have to jump forward to verse uh, 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom. Jesus increased in wisdom. If he knew everything, if he was omniscient, to use a technical term, if he knew everything because he was God, how can he increase in wisdom? If you know everything, how can you add to that? You can't. So for him to be increasing in wisdom means that he is learning. So Jesus does not begin life with all of God's wisdom resident in him. He had, he had willingly 
limited those capacities of his, and his divinity. Didn't, it doesn't mean he stopped being God. But he stopped drawing on the prerogatives and authority and power and, 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 and things that he had as God. And he's now living, having limited himself willingly to a man. He, he lives as a man. And so he is learning. And I find it interesting that he is learning from the very people that he would rebuke. as blind leaders of the blind. Just think about that. He is learning from the same people that he would rebuke as blind leaders of the blind. Folk, we can learn from anyone. We don't learn their false doctrines, but we can learn from them. You say, well, that's a contradiction. How can I learn from someone if they're teaching false doctrine? Well, just the fact that they are teaching and how they teach that false doctrine is a lesson to us. When I look at the rubbish and the nonsense some people teach, it's a lesson to me, and the lesson to me is you could be there. You could be like that if you don't remain humble, if you don't remain dependent on God, and if you don't maintain your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a lesson to us. We learn from other people's mistakes. But it doesn't mean that everything they taught was wrong. Remember, Jesus says, you, you teach people what to do, but you don't live the, those lives. He, he rebukes the same Pharisees. So there were aspects that they were teaching that was right and that was good. But there were things that they were teaching that was not right and not good. Now one of the other problems we have with this passage, and I'm going to just complete on this verse this week, uh, today, but one of the other problems we have with this passage is that there are apocryphal writings that say that Jesus was there teaching them. It's not what it says. Those are apocryphal writings. The Gospels are clear, and that is that he is in dialogue. It uses that Greek word from which we get the English word dialogue. He's in dialogue with them. He's discussing. He's asking questions, and they're giving answers, and they're asking questions, and he's giving answers. And that was simply the way they used to teach in a Jewish uh, context. The kind of teaching that we're doing right now was very foreign to them. It was more of a Greek style of teaching, where you would have a teacher teaching and then the disciples simply listen. But in all of their teaching, there would be a conversation. The questions had a purpose. The questions were to find out how much the student had absorbed, but it was also to make the other person think. So the teachers are asking Jesus questions, and the purpose is to understand what does he understand. But they're also there to, to, to make him think about where he's going. And, and in fact, you, you'll see it even in their conversations, and you'll see it right here in this passage. If you, uh, if you go back to, or forward really, um, verse 48, and so when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Notice the question. What would we do? You naughty boy. We told you, don't run away from us. But she starts with a question. It's the way that they, that they did these things. And verse 49, and he said to them, why did you seek me? Don't you know I have to be about my father's business? You see the process of asking questions and answering questions with other questions. That's the way they did things. And you'll see this in all of Jesus' teachings with his disciples and, and with people around him. That, that was the way it was happening. So it was a two-way conversation. And in the process, the student is learning, 
but the teacher is also learning. You see, you see, right now, in our style of doing things, I'm not learning anything from you. Because it's all going one way. But when we get to the door or in other situations, we have a conversation and I learn things because I'm able to listen to what you, what you, what, how you see it and your answers. And so it's a dialogue, it's a uh, two-way conversation. He is not teaching them. They are really teaching him. And so they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Now, of course, this, this is a powerful statement as to the degree to which Jesus had grown in wisdom. We're going to speak about that in, um, uh, next week, Lord willing. But he's 12 years old. He's not talking about marbles and catapults and uh, Nintendo and uh, those things. He's able to have a serious conversation with the learned men of the day. And I understand why the King James uses the word doctors, while it's not a good translation for the uh, Greek word. That, that is really who he is speaking to. These, are, the, these would be PhDs today. These would be men with doctorates in theology. And here's a 12-year-old kid having a conversation with them. And it's not just, a, it's not just a asking stupid questions. It's a meaningful conversation. They're learning and he's learning. Now, folks, here's the, here's the amazing thing, and I'm almost done. If he is living as a man, having set aside or having limited his divine power and knowledge and wisdom, which is what he has done. Now, remember then, he's now living as a normal human being. As a normal human being. And yet at 12 years old, he's able to amaze the learned guys by the things that he knew. It's in the next verse. And they all, all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. How long have you been a Christian? And how much do you understand today? Folk, there's no excuse for ignorance. There's no excuse to say I've been a Christian for five years, ten years, twelve years, twenty years, and I still know nothing. We must grow in wisdom like Jesus grew in wisdom. And obviously when we say that he was 12 years old, he was 12 years old in the flesh. And obviously we understand that we, for us it applies in the sense that we, how long we've been Christians, how long we have been in the spirit. And of course the reality is that you find Christians who've been Christians for one or two years and they have a profound understanding of the things of God. And yet there are others who've been Christians for 20, 30, 40 years and they don't have a clue. And I'll address that when we get to verse 52. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that he has made his habitation with us and that he came to live as a man amongst us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand and to learn from him that we may, may follow in his footsteps. But Lord, we pray especially this morning that in the light of Mary and Joseph somehow leaving Jesus behind, we understand, Lord, that there's a real potential for us doing the same thing and getting on with our lives and our business. And, and, and even today, Lord, maybe we have met with you here in, in this building and, and uh, been aware of your presence and heard your voice. And yet when we go from here and get to go about our business, having lunch and whatever else we do today and getting back to work tomorrow, you're left behind here.
Lord, I pray that we may not be like that. But Lord, that we may have you and take you with us. That we may walk with you and talk with you. That we may be aware of your presence and of your fellowship and of your communion with us. Moment by moment, every moment of the day, every moment of the night. There may never be a time that we are separated from you. But Lord, that we may be with you, walking with you. And so Lord, I pray that these things may be real. Lord, that they may be more than just what we have heard here this morning, but that they may be things that change our lives. I pray that you would go with us now, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that that may be more than just the benediction that we always pray that you would go with us, but, Lord, that we may take you with us, and, Lord, that we may be sure to make sure that you're alongside us, with us, in us, that we are in you as we go into this day, uh, into the rest of this day and into this week. Go with us now, then, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.